It's sort of cold in here, isn't it? <laughs> that is smart. I need a blanket. I need a blankie. So. Well, welcome. I think this is the, the last um, breakout session of the day. I hope you've enjoyed uh, visiting the other ones today. Uh, my name is Erin Fromm. I work at the University of California, Irvine. I work with Dr. Ardith Courtney, who I believe was on the panel this morning, answering some questions. And um, we're going to talk about dietary modifications today for NMO symptom management. So when we look at other uh, chronic diseases, sometimes there's a, there's a template, there's a diet for that disease. There's a cardiac disease. Um, there's a, uh, a template, a thing to follow, low sodium diets to help reduce um, congestive heart failure, that type of thing. Diabetes, there's a diabetic plan that you follow. You need to keep your insulin in check so you are really measuring your macronutrients, which are protein, carbs, and fats and you have to have a, um, a very balanced diet. Uh, for epilepsy, the ketogenic diet has been studied to reduce seizures, and um, a ketogenic diet is very high fat, um, very, primarily all fat, and uh, moderate protein and very low carbohydrates. But what about for NMO? Is there a diet for NMO that we know of? So there's a lot of theories and a lot of different clinicians have different viewpoints, but we can all agree that um, like an anti-inflammatory approach seems to make a big difference in an inflammatory disease. So we need to look at, our, we need to look at what has been studied in the past to, move, uh, to, make, to make sense of these things. The Swank diet um, we will review first, the Medugal diet, and, and then a probiotic uh, research study. So the Swank diet was actually developed back in the 40s by Dr. Roy Swank. Now he's measuring, or he's following uh, multiple sclerosis patients because that's what we had back in that time, and that's the research that we have available, and it does follow the same pathogenicity for um, NMO, so that's why we're looking at this. And he had a large cohort, I think he had about 1,500 patients that he followed for 35 years. Um, unfortunately his results were criticized by other scientists because it lacked a control group, so we didn't have comparison for scientific validation. The diet was strict, or is strict. Um, saturated fat is anything like animal fat, coconut oils, um, butter, and basically you had to limit it to 15 grams per day. And to put that into perspective, a chicken thigh is 10 grams, so you're already nearly at your, your max for the day. Um, a pat of butter is 12 grams. Um, unsaturated fats are considered to be your healthy fats, like avocados, salmon, and um, olive oils, nuts, seeds, that type of thing. And you're allowed 20 to 50 grams per day of this type of unsaturated fat. So sitting down to a salmon dinner um, puts you halfway to your goal on that. So what did it show? And over the years, over 35 years, the patients that adhered to the less than 20 grams per day actually had um, slight deterioration in their disease process, and the death rate was 31%, whereas the people that ate a higher fat diet had serious disability progression over the years and 79 to 81% death rate. That seems pretty significant to me. So Dr. McDougall came along, he studied under Dr. Swank, and he wanted to, um, he wanted he wanted validation. He wanted to prove that this um, type of diet actually does improve disease process and demyelination. And so he wanted to look at MRI data. He wanted to use actual images, MRI images, to see if it made a difference in disease progression. He also wanted to look at fatigue. And he used fatigue scores, different questionnaires. And this diet went on for one year. Um, if, unfortunately, it was limited because he only had $700,000 to uh, run the study for a year. And so the MRI data was not helpful because one year is not enough to look at MRI results and, and disease progression. Um, but it did show improved fatigue, which is significant. Probiotics are getting a lot of buzz these days. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard <laughs> about probiotics. But Dr. Um, Kuchaki did a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled uh, trial, which is the gold standard. Um, basically, it was two groups, one's getting placebo and one is not. 
And they did a 12-week um, study design, and they used VSL3 probiotic, which is a common probiotic sold at Costco, CVS. And what they wanted to measure for their endpoints were disability, mental health, and metabolic indicators. Metabolic indicators are things like insulin levels, cholesterol levels, um, that type of thing. And it did have favorable outcomes on disability. Um, they used the EDSS score, which is a zero to 10 score your neurologist uses to measure your level of disability. And if it moved greater than one point, that was considered um, statistically significant. Mental health improved. All the inflammatory markers in the body improved. And it turns out that anti-inflammatory, um, having an anti-inflammatory environment actually shortens the duration of relapses. And again, they measured this in MS. We need NMO studies. Uh, but given the similarities in, in um, demyelination, it may be something helpful. So we want to talk a little bit about NMO symptoms and then what we can do to try and manage them. Because this is just a few of the symptoms that people suffer with NMO. Neurogenic bowel, neurogenic bladder, fatigue, alters your sleep cycle, your quality of life is affected, and a lot of people suffer depression and anxiety. So a neurogenic bowel is a manifestation of constipation, fecal incontinence, and evacuation difficulty. Um, it's due to the lesion location on your spinal cord and affects a lot of people. And it's, it's, um, we want to know, is there anything you can do to manage this with nutrition? So on the top of the pyramid is fiber. And uh, the American diet is lacking fiber. And fiber, 25 grams, is actually pretty hard to reach. Um, does anyone know how much is in a cup of broccoli? How many grams of fiber? Okay, no one seems to know the answer. And I was totally surprised to learn it's only four grams in a cup of broccoli. <laughs> and you think fiber, you think broccoli, right? And that's always what people think. Um, so uh, raspberries actually have eight grams of fiber in a cup. And lentils are the, like, probably the, one of the highest fiber foods that you can have. It's 16 grams. Nuts have fiber, um, sprouted grains have fiber, um, coffee has fiber in it too, surprisingly. So, but it's important because fiber bulks the stool. It's a non-digestible um, uh, nutrient. And in, with, fi with fiber though, you need water. You need a lot of water and that's why hydration is included in this because that helps ease pas passage of stool and the fiber um, absorbs water. So you want to have a lot of water along with your, your increased fiber intake, otherwise you'll be very uncomfortable. Um, again, we talk, probiotics come, come up here because probiotics create an anti-inflammatory state. Um, the gut, your gut is make a, made up of a microbiome. I think that most people are familiar with that term these days. Um, but the bugs in your gut actually change with what you eat. So they have studied patients who ate um, anti-inflammatory diets. The microbiome was different than when they ate, like crap. So um, essentially, when you have a good diet, you have good bugs. And then when you didn't eat very well, you didn't have enough of the good bugs in there, which sets off your digestion. And that goes along with processed foods as well. So processed foods are not real food, unfortunately. But the American diet, I mean, we all, you know, we can't avoid it. It's part of our culture. But if you can um, try to eliminate its processed foods because they really wreak havoc on your digestive system. It's very hard to um, digest. Okay, so neurogenic bladder is a manifestation of urinary frequency, incomplete emptying, urinary incontinence, nocturia, getting up frequently during the night to have, having to go to the bathroom and then UTIs, um, uh, urinary tract infections. What can you do? Well, we know what you should avoid, and those are bladder irritants. Um, caffeine is a known bladder irritant. Um, alcohol, spicy food, um, capsaicin, that's the um, chemical compound in spicy food, is known to be a bladder irritant. And then soda. Um, for bladder health, it's good to consume a lot of water, you know, flushing out your system. And berries are 
are really good for bladder health. They have a lot of antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties to them. Most people are familiar with drinking cranberry juice when you have a bladder infection. I think that's kind of common. Um, but they do have, you know, they're, they're strong. You know, the berries have a lot of powerful properties to them, which make a big difference with bladder health and also in your system. One of the biggest complaints I hear from patients is um, fatigue. It's one of the worst, most debilitating effects quality of life. And um, there are some things that you can do to manage fatigue with nutrition. Um, again, that low fat diet comes back up. And by low fat, we're talking about um, kind of the same parameters that the Swank diet followed, but trying to focus more on healthy fats like salmon and um, nuts and, and seeds. And it shows that um, your insulin levels and your, your lipid levels, when they're normalized, fatigue levels improve in, in people. Um, a healthy BMI also improves fatigue levels. Vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency is a very common, um, it's very common in NMO, and it actually is um, responsible for the aggressiveness of your disease. So vitamin D supplementation is hugely important, and um, I, I hope everyone's taking it. <laughs> Does everyone know their levels? No? Okay, so the takeaway today is the, at our clinic, and it's up to your clinician and whoever you see, but um, our, my physician recommends 5,000 international units per day. Most people are taking like 400, so it's nowhere near where you need to be at your levels. So it, vitamin D is, to, is, is toxic because it's fat soluble, okay. but it's toxic in a normal um, person, not a person with an inflammatory myelin, demyelinated disease. It's really actually hard to get levels for um, our FS patients and our NMO patients up to, a, um, up to the level that we want them at. That being said, you need to monitor your levels every four to six months while you're supplementing because you don't want to become toxic. I haven't seen anyone, um, I think we have about a thousand patients. I've, I've never seen anybody get to a toxic level. Do you, do you have kids in your study? Pediatrics? Uh, pediatrics? Yeah. No, no. That's a good question though. I'm sure you get yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. And, and kids are actually more inflammatory in disease states than adults are. So, um, but I would, that's a really good question. You have to think about that. <laughs> yes. Is there a standard dose that should be taken? So our recommendation is 5,000 international units per day. But again, uh, your clinician might not agree with that. That's just what we practice. And we do keep, we, we monitor levels every four months on everyone. So, yes. So my question is, I live in Massachusetts, so. No son. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think, is it the same? God. I don't know, but whenever it's just done, I'm like running towards it. It's like never it's fun. I can't, I can't endorse tanning because it, it's a carcinogenic, you know, it can cause cancer. Um, but I, you know, there's, there's high, um, high vitamin D foods, like fortified foods, um, like fish and that type of thing, or, if you can drink milk, milk has a lot of vitamin D in it, so. Oh, sorry, I think you were first. Well, I just okay, want so. to mention, I live in Oregon. Uh -huh. There's no sun there, you guys live in California, and yeah. I don't know where everyone's from, but they recommend 10,000 IUs a day for people yeah. in Oregon, so that might answer your question. No, and, and that's true, you know, because people look at us, like 5,000 is just hugely, uh, you know, it's like a, a big dose, but um, I grew up in Seattle, so. I know that the sun doesn't shine very often, and when it does, it's a glorious day. <laughs> so 10,000 might make sense for someone who doesn't have the sun. And in Southern California, we have um, a lot of sun, but a lot of sunscreen. So that's part of the problem, because we're blocking that, uh, the, the effects that we, the good effects from the sun. So I'm from Florida, where there's a lot of sun, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wear a lot of sunscreen. So right. I, I do take 5,000 um, uh, of vitamin D daily now. Uh, only because my um, osteo, now I've been diagnosed at the very start of osteoporosis with all the steroids I've right. used over 
10 years um, that I've been diagnosed. So with that being said, I do get my numbers checked because I had a potassium and um, sodium issue too, so I'm now on a potassium pill to increase my potassium. But with the vitamin, um, the 5,000, my doctors also recommended that I take a calcium. Yes. And also magnesium. Yes. To and that, yep. Okay. You so, are on track because okay. um, one without the other doesn't um, absorb in your body. Or so so um, they're, they do sell those together, at least um, vitamin D3 and calcium. And Puritan's Pride is a company that um, that I will endorse because I've heard of them, yeah. they make a good quality product and they combine the two. So Puritan, like a P-U-R-I-T-A-N, Puritan's Pride. So as long as I am getting the vitamin D levels checked, mm -hmm. the 5,000 is something fine to stay on forever. As Absolutely. Long as okay. okay. Yeah, and recommended. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Just real quick. Mm -hmm. And um, it's supposedly 50,000, I think. But he, on my following test, it showed that that was not high enough for me because he said I was still low on vitamin D. Is there a higher dosage that well, I need to take? I'm surprised you're taking it just weekly. Um, most people I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, take a daily dose. Um, mm -hmm. They also have a liquid form that sometimes is. Um, easy, uh, more highly absorbed in the body. Uh, but again, the, the, it ranges from five to even 10,000 per day. Okay. Um, so you might want to discuss with them, do you know what your level is? I don't remember at the moment. I okay. have it at home, I just. Right. It's mostly yeah. the, your neurologist who really cares what your levels are and that gets us. Well, it's my general doctor that gave me that. Okay. So he was surprised that I was low, but he didn't really up the dosage or anything. So should I take it more like on a daily? Would that yeah, make a difference? I can't, I definitely can't speak for your clinician, right. but in our practice, uh, we have our patients take 5,000 per day if you have a demyelinating disease because you're deficient in it and it affects your disease. It makes your disease more aggressive if you're not getting adequate amounts. Okay, so kind Just, of turning my question around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Would it be better to take a daily dosage instead of a weekly dosage then? I would think so considering that your number hasn't popped up. All right, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. So um, again, probiotics comes up here too with fatigue because those studies that they did on probiotics also showed um, a, a decrease in fatigue, which made a big difference. And then um, anti-inflammatory foods, again, antioxidants, um, such things like carotenoids and flavonoids, the things that are found in whole natural foods and fruits and berries and that type of thing make a really big difference in your um, environment. Um, decreasing inflammation. Okay. Depression is another very common, um, common problem with NMO. And there are some studies that show omega-3, which you can supplement with omega-3s, but it's also in, again, fish. I think salmon must be like the most glorious food here today. Um, but it's also in flax, uh, flax seeds, walnuts, and soybeans. Flax seeds and Chia seeds are actually sold at places like Trader Joe's now where they weren't always available and can be thrown into food um, or smoothies, that type of thing, so they're easily um, can be incorporated in your diet. Um, it's also an important component of myelin, and as we all know, myelin is that protective sheath around your brain and your spinal cord, and that's exactly what is being chomped away um, in NMO. So it's an important component. Um, and it also, you know, a healthier lifestyle leads to decreased depression. So this little apple icon right here is for this word, and I'm sorry it's not bigger. This is an app, it's called Chronometer. Um, we could use technology to make life a little more doable with chronic disease. Chronometer actually, you enter in your food and it actually breaks down every single nutrient of the, the foods that you eat. So if you enter in your meals for the day, um, it breaks down your calories and all your, your carbs, your saturated mono and unsaturated fats, your proteins, all your vitamins, and your fiber. And then you hover over that, um, that value, and it will tell you, like let's say for fiber, you hover over that, it tells you exactly what foods you ate that day that had fiber in it, and then you know where to really reach your goals, your nutrient goals. Um, I think it's, you can open it up on your computer or if um, tech savvy people on a phone. 
MyFitnessPal people like to use as well for um, food journaling. Uh, sometimes food allergies are triggers, and it's a little bit different in NMO because a lot of patients are on prednisone, and when you're getting tested for food allergies, it can make a difference on those Ig levels that they're testing, so it might not be accurate. So let's say you think you're gluten intolerant and you go get tested. Your gluten test might be inaccurate based off of if you're taking um, uh, glucocorticoids and you know, solumedrol and that type of thing. But um, someone brought up a good point, like an elimination diet makes a big difference. An elimination diet would mean um, 21 to 30 days of elim eliminating all like food triggers that you think are making um, life hard, and then slowly add that one food back three days at a time to see if that indeed is a food trigger for you. So, those who are not on steroids, they actually can have food allergy tests, and it, it might be beneficial. Um, processed foods, I can't stress enough that it just creates, it creates inflammation in the body. So while we have, you know, children and goldfish in our pantry and, you know, all the things that, you know, we do to survive and get by in life, if you can strive for 80 to 90 percent of eating um, anti-inflammatory foods, um, create a good environment in your body, and 10 percent of the time you have the birthday cake, you know, enjoy your life. Um, but we really strive to make a difference with disease management. Okay, Q and A. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, supplementing calcium and magnesium as well. I know that magnesium always comes with like a combination, like magnesium oxide or sulfate. Yes. What's the best combo to get? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm trying to think back when I worked in the, um, worked in the, I used to work in the hospitals back in the day, like in the ICU, and we had different uh, magnesiums, like slow meg and that type of thing. But I actually, I don't have a good answer for you mm -hmm. on that. I'll have to look it up. Okay. Um, but I do know, at least with vitamin D and calcium, it mm -hmm. should be taken together and it mm -hmm. should be a D3. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yes. I think she's right behind you, too. Okay. Um, I have been looking into a all added sugars free diet and possibly gluten free diet at NMO. Do you think that's a good idea? Yes. You know why? Because sugar causes inflammation. It, it just does. And if you know that, um, if, if you look at or if you talk to other people who have cut sugar out, except for sh um, fruits, fruits are important. Uh, because fruits contain not just, you know, glucose that you need for healthy function in your body, but it also contains fiber and um, like bananas have fat, like other things that you need other than nutrients. But sugar, just white, plain sugar alone is highly inflammatory. Um, gluten is, not everyone's gluten intolerant, but if you notice for you it's making a difference, then it's worth it, whether or not you have an allergy to it. I'm not gluten intolerant as far as I know, but I have heard that it helps um, reduce inflammation. There's a lot of buzz, um, but the research is shortcoming so okay. far. But onward and upward with research trials we go. So we might find out something later in life that it makes a difference. Awesome, so, thank you. Yeah, sure. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I just recently started taking um, probiotics, and I think it's really kind of helping me, mm -hmm. uh, but I can't quantify that. It, I don't know much about them. Is there a amount or a brand or a type? So the, the brand um, that I can endorse was the one that was in the research trial, which is the VSL3. Um, and again, that is VSL3, V like Victor. And that was, um, that's sold at Costco or CVS. So it's easy to get. If you go on Amazon and you type in probiotics, my God. <laughs> And 40 billion and 90 million, yeah. Yes. Yes. And the it has eight strains of bacteria, good good gut bacteria. So don't get, um, you know, uh, looped into the 40 million strains that type of thing. It's completely overwhelming. And typing in diet, even on Pinterest, if you go on Pinterest, there's a diet for everything. It's overwhelming. So, yes. Mm -hmm. 
was one of one a very good brand too. But thank you. Um, as far as acidophilus, do you mm -hmm. think that's yeah? Can that be combined with a probiotic? Yes, and, and acidophilus, I believe, is a um, has good enzyme um, in the system. I think it helps digest food easier. Okay. Um, and taking in combination is not harmful, and it's it's completely Cause, allowed because that's what I, I someone had told me to add that but I wasn't sure and I wanted to wait till yeah. I got here to and then the other thing what do you feel about dairy because we, we all know it it causes inflammation and yeah. so, I feel better yeah. because I have gone dairy free and, and that's that's my case in point um, it, like every single person if um, you had milk and you had milk you might have two different reactions to it and how your body tolerates it um, the big problem with milk is the hormones and antibiotics that have been um, infiltrated into our cows. And that's really the big issue. I suppose that if it were just back in the olden days and it was just straight cow milk, I don't think we would have the same um, allergic responses to it. So if the, the takeaway is if it works for you and it makes you feel better, then, then you do not need that. You need to find your calcium sources elsewhere though. Um, I think spinach, you know, because spinach tastes just like milk, right? <laughs> Blend it with a little water. Um, but unsweetened um, almond milk is a really healthy alternative, too. So, mm. yes. Another question. Sure. I have um, slow gastric um, emptying, mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of comes and goes. Um, mm -hmm. Is there something to keep in mind when I'm having a bad slow gastric emptying day? These questions, boy, um, yeah, because <laughs> I know that even your neurologist can't answer that question for you, right? right? But I'm wondering if like a high fiber something could contribute to gas in the stomach if it sits too long? Well, and this is the thing with fiber too. Um, it has to be equally, um, you have to have enough hydration to handle the fiber. And a lot of people don't stick to a high fiber diet because it's uncomfortable at first until your body gets used to it. Um, most people have like a lot of gassiness and bloat bloatiness with it, especially with slow gastric emptying. So you feel like you can't win. And that's where I find that, you know, adding slowly into your diet, those foods that you can tolerate, those are the foods that you need to eat, but also the probiotics should affect and make a difference in your, um, in how you tolerate that fiber. Does the probiotic instantly help? Can you take it one day and then you're fine? Or should, do you, does it have to build up over I don't, time? I don't think it feels like, I think most people don't take them regularly because they don't notice a difference because it's one of those things, even like vitamin D, even though you know you should take it, you don't feel a, you know, a big difference, but you should take it because it is making a difference. And same with the probiotics. And all of these things are not one thing alone. It's not a lovely magic pill. It's a combination of things. So Good. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Um, my question is still with hydration, considering the fact that most of us have bladder issues. Right. I am not going to take a whole gallon of water in the morning yeah. to go to work to then, like, you know, have accidents all day. Is there any other type of, I guess, liquid foods or anything yes. or any other combination that we can't take to hydrate that's not water, that's not making us have accidents all day? Absolutely. And I do suggest drinking your water in the morning, but not a gallon of it. <laughs> and I would suggest um, uh, melons, like watermelon and um, honeydew and cantaloupe. Um, and cucumbers, that type of thing, those are all high water content, which hydrate you. And those count towards your water consumption for the day. So if you can sit at your desk and have, um, you know, a couple slices of watermelon, not only are you getting your, your um, fiber and your, um, your hydration, but it's also antioxidants as well. So it's a win, win, win. So, yes. There's been a lot of buzz about like vegan diets too. Yeah. And like eating meats and a lot of protein through meats. Yeah, so the thing about, like I was talking about Pinterest, if you go on Pinterest, you type in diets, you're gonna get just, you know, the whole world of, of diets. So there's a lot of um, um, validity to eating clean and eating vegan. It's just that not everyone can adhere to it. So I would suggest, like, um, uh, like for what feels right and feels good for you. If it's a good quality diet, like vegan diet is, you know, well recognized in the health community. It's well supported. You get your protein. You know, it's still a very healthy diet. So let's say you feel an affinity to it, then it would be something worth trying. If it's something where you feel like you're just constantly um, 
uh, torturing yourself by not having a piece of chicken <laughs> or an egg, then it's not going to work uh, for you. And some people are just, they have an affinity towards a certain food group. Um, the only food group you shouldn't have an affinity to is sugar. And we do because we get addicted to it. So once you clean it out and you clear it out, you don't have that same um, addiction. It, it goes away. Um, just a quick question. So out of the three, dairy, gluten, and sugar, you would say sugar is the biggest one to cut out? It's the most inflammatory. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Earlier you were talking about eating for your gut. So I guess my question would be, is there a resource that you suggest for um, people to look into to um, like a book or something like that that guides you to the best foods to eat um, that are going to give you the good bugs that you were talking about to kind of keep propelling you forward? It's a good question. Um, I think that what you're trying to ask is, you know, what, what is the best diet for that? And essentially it's cutting out the crap. <laughs> <laughs> To simplify things, yeah. it really is. It's, um, it's not all what you put in your gut, but it's what you take away. And when they looked at the two groups, um, even then the same person, a person who ate a bunch of like processed foods and like saturated um, fats that were added, like pres food preservatives and that type of thing, it altered the, um, like that whole leaky gut syndrome. So it did make a difference in the gut flora. Sort of like think of your, your intestine as a garden and you want your garden to flourish and be beautiful, but you throw a bunch of crap on there and then all the flowers died. And so when you put in all good food, it had flourishing garden flowers and then your bowel is functioning. Your bowel is never gonna be perfect in NMO, in NMO, but you still can do some things to kind of help manage it, manage your symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, I, I'm just curious, I, I, I think I might have even asked this last year, but is there a specific... Hi, um, <laughs> it, my question is, is there a specific anti-inflammatory diet that someone could follow? If you Google that, you'll find 500. <laughs> but I can tell you there are anti-inflammatory foods. Yes. And you can actually pull up a list of anti-inflammatory foods on a trusted, um, you know, reputable website. I think even the, um, the MS Society has um, uh, which is useful for NMO information too, but you can pull up their information on nutrition and pull up an entire list of anti-inflammatory foods. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I, I consciously, even before I got, you know, sick and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I try to eat healthy. I, I, you know, we do the colors we do, we eat, yeah. you know, but, um, some people say, oh, it's, it's because uh, you've got to eat that anti-inflammatory diet. That's why you've got this, and Ugh. you know, and um, that's why you got the transverse myelitis and the NMO because you got, you know, if you just change to an anti, it would all go away. And and it's um, if it's really a, because I'm trying my best. Right. And, right. And it's uh, it, it gets a little bit frustrating, and 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 it, so I just thought I'd ask you again mm -hmm. if there's some magic thing that it, I'm sure we'd all be on it. <laughs> well, I think it, it's, I think, um, I think people, <laughs> I think people make ju judgments based off of their Google searches and they're not, you know, scientists, they're not practicing clinicians and they don't have a, a foot to stand on. Um, so if you can try to put the noise behind you as much as possible, because clearly you're doing the right thing. Um, by eating pretty healthy, even prior to your disease process. Nothing causes NMO that we have found. Nothing causes MS that we have found. And so all you can do is work with what you, what you can, but the noise needs to go away. So try to make life easier. Uh, yeah. sure. So I've, I've done the whole like, you know, trying to go organic and mm -hmm. seeing the difference. Is there really like, a, like, if you buy an organic apple and a regular apple at the supermarket, Good question. Is that going to make a difference? It's a good question. And there's, unfortunately, like I would love to say you don't need to buy organic because organic food is expensive. The problem is, is that all the pesticides, you really can't win. Um, like the pesticides and everything that's in our soil and even from the, the rain and the, the acid that comes down from there um, can, can affect the quality of your food. 
And so there is something called a dirty dozen. Um, look it up online and it will tell you which foods you need to buy organic. So the dirty dozen because it's the highly penetratable um, where the pesticides get into the fruit itself. There's, and then the rest of the fruits and vegetables you can just wash, hand wash and you should be fine. And I, th I think we're supposed to wrap it up unless there's one last question. Anyone? Nope. You know, oh, sure. Okay. Is, uh, probiotics. There is a. Um, have you heard of the Saccharomyces boulardii? It is. It's a yeast. It's not a bacteria, but it is specific for C. diff. If anyone knows what C. diff yes. is, yes. Um, because C. diff is just treated with antibiotics, and then yeah. it goes on and on and on. Yeah, so C. diff so. occurs when you disrupt your, um, your gut, um, and that bug takes over and causes um, a horrifying, um, nasty illness that leaves you in the hospital. So. Or death. Yeah, I worked with a lot of patients that died from C. diff toxicity. So. On that bright note, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.